Hi, this is Susan Knowles, and welcome to my podcast on the nervous system. We're briefly going to review the anatomy and physiology. And this is meant to be a reference for you as you uh, study the neurological system throughout the nursing program. The structures of the nervous system are composed of the central nervous system, which is the brain and the spinal cord, the peripheral nervous system, which is the uh, cranial, both the cranial and the spinal nerves, and then the autonomic nervous system, which is our sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. One of the most important aspects of the nervous system is the neuron. The neuron generates the nerve impulse or excitability, and it transmits the in- it transmits the impulse to the other portions of the cell, which is conductivity. It has the ability to influence other neurons, muscle cells, or glandular cells by transmitting the nerve impulse to them. The synapse is one of the most interesting portions of the nervous system to me personally. It's the structural and functional junction between two neurons. It's where the impulse is transmitted. There are two types of impulses, both chemical and electrical. An interesting part about this to me is that the a chemical synapse is a small gap that exists between the terminals of one neuron and then the dendrites of the other. And that's where the neurotransmitters are released. At an electrical synapse, The two neurons are actually physically connected to one another via the gap junction. And this gap is where it is made possible for um, an electrical signal in one neuron to pass directly to the other one. And as we study different conditions of the neurological system, we can see where neurotransmitters become so important The major structural components of the central nervous system are the spinal cord and the brain. And the brain consists of the cerebellum, the brain stem, and the cerebrum. The brain consists of both the right and the left hemispheres. The right side of the brain controls muscles on the left side of the body. And of course, then that means that the left side of the brain controls muscles on the right side of the body. Usually, sensory information from the left side of the body crosses over to the right side of the body, and information from the right side of the body crosses over to the left side of the body. Therefore, damage to one side of the brain will affect the opposite side of the body. In the 1860s and 1870s, 70s, there were two neurologists, Paul Broca and Carl uh, Wernicke who observed that people who had damage to a particular area on the left side of the brain had speech and language problems, whereas people with damage on the right side usually didn't have any language problems. The two language areas of the brain that are important for language now bear the, their names of those two neurologists, which is the Broca area and the Wernicke area. It's important to remember that the brain um, has the cerebrum, the cerebral cortex, as I've mentioned, the right and left hemispheres, contains ventricles, cerebral spinal fluid. We have the brain stem, the cerebellum. The interesting thing is that the infant's brain is about 12% of their body weight, and in an adult, it's only about 2% of the body weight. And an infant also also has about one-third as much cerebral spinal fluid. There are four lobes to the brain, and in my other podcast where I talk about the anatomy of the brain, I go into more depth. But generally speaking, the frontal lobe is responsible for higher cognition, memory retention, voluntary eye movements, motor movements, and expressive speech. The temporal lobes uh, are located behind the frontal lobe, and it's responsible for receptive speech, somatic, visceral, and auditory data. 
then the parietal lobes are responsible for controlling and interpreting spatial information. And then the occipital lobe is responsible for sight or vision. So other structures of the brain, the limbic system is mostly responsible for our emotions. And then we have um, the basal ganglia, which are a pair of structures that are centrally located in the cerebrum and the midbrain on both sides of the thalamus. And their function is to modulate um, or uh, initiate or execute and complete voluntary and automatic movements with skeletal activities, such as swinging of our arms when we walk, swallowing saliva, and blinking. And this will become important when we study uh, Parkinson's. The hypothalamus is inferior to the thalamus in front of the midbrain, and it regulates our um, autonomic nervous system as well as our endocrine function. The thalamus is directly above the mid, uh, excuse me, the brainstem, and it's our major relay center for sensory impulse to the cerebral cortex. The brainstem includes the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla, and these are the vital centers that are concerned with respiratory, vasomotor, and cardiac function. In a particularly in the medulla. The brainstem itself contains the centers for sneezing, coughing, hiccuping, vomiting, sucking, and swallowing. And of course, that becomes critically important when you're caring for a patient that is comatose or should you be dealing with a child or an infant. The reticular formation relays sensory information and it's also responsible for excitatory and inhibitory control of spinal motor neurons, it controls vasomotor motor and respiratory activity, and the RAS itself regulates the system for arousal. Of course, that becomes important when we're assessing the level of consciousness in a patient. Um, we are actually looking at the RAS. The cerebellum is located under the occipital lobe along with the brain stem, and it receives information from the cerebral cortex. It coordinates voluntary movement to maintain the trunk stability as well as our equilibrium. The spinal cord is continuous with the brain stem and it exits the cranial cavity through the foramen magnum. It transmits signals to and from the brain the spinal pathways and tracks are named for the points of origin as well and their points of destination. We have both sensory and motor tracks, and in general, the ascending tracks carry specific sensory information to the higher levels of the uh, central nervous system, and the descending tracks carry impulses that are responsible for muscle movement. The lower motor neurons are the final common pathways uh, through which the descending motor tracts influence skeletal muscles and the effector organs for movement. The cell bodies of these cells are located in the spinal cord and the axons innervate the skeletal muscles. Going back up to the where the, um, the spinal cord is connected to the brain, through that foramen magnum becomes really important when we start talking about brain injuries that increase the intracranial pressure. These next structures are considered protective structures, and that includes the blood brain barrier, which is a physiologic barrier not an actual barrier, between capillary, capillaries and brain tissue. And it protects the brain from harmful agents. It allows nutrients and gases to enter the brain, and it affects the penetration of drugs into the brain. And that becomes really important when we're looking at trying to get medications 
into the brain. In the case of some sort of uh, infection where you want to actually get an antibiotic into the brain, you need to be able to cross the blood-brain barrier. Um, Lipid-soluble compounds tend to enter easily. Damage to the blood-brain barrier results in penetration of drugs or other substances in the brain that we don't want to get there. The skull is the bony structure that protects the brain from the external, uh, any external trauma. The largest opening or hole in the skull is the foramen magnum, which we just talked about. It's the only major space for the brain's expansion in uh, increased intracranial pressure. In an infant, um, they have several bones that are not fused at birth, and they usually don't fuse until about 12 to 18 months. The vertebral column itself protects the spinal cord. It supports the head. There are 33 individual vertebrae, which you may remember from A and P. And each has a central opening that allows the spinal cord to pass through it. There are the intervertebral discs and the spaces between the vertebrae, which acts as a cushion. We have the meninges, and there are three layers of protective membranes surrounding the brain and the spinal cord. The dura matter is that thick, tough, outermost layer. The pia matter is the next two layers. The uh, arachnoid is the membrane below the dura, and then the subarachnoid is the space just below the arachnoid before the pia. Well, the pediatric differences in the central nervous system, um, just to name a few, at birth, and during the early childhood, the fontanelles are, uh, are not closed, and the bones have not ossified, and that's to allow that brain to expand. Young infants have a proportionately large or heavy head compared with adults, as I mentioned in the earlier part of the podcast, as well as that infants have about 50 milliliters of uh, cerebral spinal fluid, whereas adults have about 150 milliliters. This concludes this. Uh, A and P discussion of the neurological system. Thank you.